ecosystem. What is it all about? Is it just a buzzword? And if not, how can we forge a meaningful path ahead with it? But before we get into that, ladies and gentlemen, please do take note. We'll put up the Slido QR code for you to uh, have your questions ready so that when we do have our Q&A session, you have those questions ready for our panelists. Web3 ecosystem. Maybe for a lot of us, this is a new word that we have yet to hear, while for some of you, it's something that you have been eagerly anticipating. So I'm really looking forward to this next session that we have for you, ladies and gentlemen. Two, one, two, three, press one, two, press one, two. All right, as we prepare our panelists and our moderator for this upcoming session, ladies and gentlemen, please do share your feedback via this QR code. We'd really love to hear what you think about our sessions earlier in panel two, earlier on drone tech, and also on panel four, is Malaysia ready to be a data-driven nation? We really appreciate your feedback and hearing what you have to say about our sessions today and on Malaysia Digital as a whole. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is the QR code up on the screen for you. For any questions that you may have regarding Malaysia's Web3 ecosystem, please do send in your questions throughout the session and we will uh, bring up the questions for you as soon as the panel session is done. Now, ladies and gentlemen, for our next session, Building the path ahead for Malaysia's Web3 ecosystem, I'd like to invite on stage our moderator for the session. Mohan Lau is the head of digital creative content at MDEC, where he helps drive the mission to develop the digital creative content industry in Malaysia. With over 15 years of experience in the digital content space, Mohan has a particular interest in leading teams across games development, games commercialization, and now ecosystem building. Having launched over 30 games during the course of his career. So uh, we have no one better to run this session than you, Mohan. So uh, take it away and introducing our panelists. Over to you. All right, all right. Thank you, thank you, MC. Uh, pretty honored today to have such a prestigious uh, and, you know, uh, original team of uh, <laughs> entrepreneurs and Thought leaders in the Web3 space in Malaysia. Yeah. So I, I'm not going to do justice by introducing themselves. So I'm going to leverage and you know get them to do a quick, short, brief introduction about themselves. Shall I start? Yep. Thank Hi, you. my name is Ganesh Kumar Banga. I'm the executive chairman of Netcentric Limited. Um, serial tech entrepreneur myself. Uh, I was involved in payments uh, in the year 2000. Started a company called MOL. And then from there, I went into social networking, acquired Friendster in 2010. From there, I actually went to e-commerce, started an e-commerce ecosystem called Commerce.Asia, which I'm also the executive chairman of and founder, where we, today we have 92,000 merchants uh, with a gross merchandise volume of um, 1.5 billion US last year. And uh, about two years ago, I acquired a company called Netcentric, which I'm representing here today, that owns the largest influencer marketing platform in Malaysia, Nafneng. And just a couple of months ago, we started to expand into Web3, where we invested in a company called NFT Technologies and are creating an NFT technology platform to enable Malaysian creators and also global creators to issue utility NFTs uh, with a good user experience as well, leveraging on distribution through our influencer network. My name is Lee Fendi. I am the president and the founder of a Crypto Valley Malaysia Association. We are a non-profit tech movement where we uh, gather uh, the players, industry people in the cryptographic tech and blockchain. And also, uh, we do awareness, R&D with a lot of uh, government agencies such as uh, Cybersecurity Malaysia. And I'm also the CEO of a Block Work where we do a lot of uh, system integration on the blockchain, such as blockchain for certificates, uh, security documents, halal supply blockchain, and of course now we also involved with a Web3 that focusing on the metaverse, uh, where we, we are, we are developing, developing some sort of a metaverse university education, and I'm so happy to be here, and we will share a lot after this on Web3. Thank you. Hi everyone, Jensen here. 
I'm more from the gaming side of blockchain. So probably the more fun stuff, I guess. Um, uh, effectively, I'm from PathDAO, co-founder of PathDAO. Uh, what we do is we are builders in the gaming ecosystem, um, in the blockchain ecosystem. And uh, one of our key, f I mean, we do investments in a lot of blockchain games, but one of our key flagship um, products is effectively a social network for gamers, where we, we, are, you know, we build a social network powered by blockchain, powered by NFTs, powered by currency, to build this whole new interaction between gamers and content creators. So yeah, that's about me. All right. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Matthew. I'm from uh, Etherscan. Uh, so basically what we do is we build uh, search engines for the blockchain to allow our folks to look up information and just figure out what's happening on the blockchain. Thank you. Hi, my name is Faz. I am the CEO of MX Global. We are a uh, regulated or legal cryptocurrency exchange here in Malaysia. I also advise a layer one blockchain project called Zetrix, which most recently um, has partnered with Mimos and the Malaysian government to create uh, the Malaysian blockchain infrastructure. So we're, we're the public chain partner for, for that to kind of build cross borders, uh, real world use cases. All right. So I, I think some of these guys are super humble in, in a way they describe themselves. But uh, anyway, let's, uh, let's explore like, you know, why Web3, right? Uh, you know, Web3 is considered this upcoming technology that's going to be defining how things, businesses are going to be run in the future and a lot of other use, use cases. But, uh, you know, what are the best use cases or why are we looking into Web3 in general, right? How does it help the general people? Um, perhaps, uh, Ganesh, you could take, take this one first. Sure, I think um, I think it's still the early days. Uh, to be honest, when it comes to Web three, um, if you look at the blockchain, a lot of the real applications for, for blockchain are still yet uh, to be there yet, yet to be developed. I always give a, a analogy that if you look back at the year two thousand and eight, I believe when Uber started, why was Uber actually created in the year two thousand eight? Why wasn't it created in the year two thousand? Why wasn't it created in the year twenty? 20, for example, because there was a technology that was enabled on the iPhone. It was a GPS technology. It was a notification technology. Notifications actually helped WhatsApp be created. If there was no notifications in your handphone, WhatsApp wouldn't be here today. If there was no GPS in your handphone, Uber wouldn't be here today. It's those technologies that actually enabled the real-life applications to be created. Now, today, if we look at blockchain, it is a technology there, and the applications are really fresh to be developed, right? And some of those applications, of course, are being developed today by, I think, not only the people on the stage, but people from all over the world. Uh, the biggest differentiation we have in Malaysia today compared to before when it comes to blockchain and Web3 is we're actually at the same level as everybody else. I've been starting to spend actually time in the Web3 space over the last one to two months and realized the number of real-world applications that are being created in Malaysia is amazing. And some of these applications are fresh, like there are no copycats. Like You're not copying like Grab, copying Uber, right? You're not copying applications in the US. They're really creating fresh applications, new applications that actually can become global first. And I think therein lies the opportunity in Web3 is that we can create applications leveraging on this technology blockchain that's still fresh out of the gate. And with that, we can build global applications from here in Malaysia. One of the key users, usage of Web3, really, if you look at, if you look at the entire industry, is actually the disruption of monopolies. The value of blockchain is you can easily disrupt monopolies very easily. I was having lunch last week at Token 2049, which was a blockchain event. A friend of mine invited me for lunch with this guy who just one year ago, two years ago before the pandemic, was selling food in a gym in LA. Today, he runs the biggest NFT conference in the world, NFT LA. And he's now developing an application to disrupt YouTube. So he's developing a platform where YouTubers or other content creators can really put up their videos on this platform and consumers can go and look at those videos and sponsors can also join this platform and the money given by the sponsors part of it goes to the consumers and he wants to disrupt youtube 
blockchain enables the next real disruption, and without blockchain, it's difficult to, to get that opportunity. All right. Maybe I, I can I can uh, touch a little bit on uh, on the layman perspective on what is actually Web Web 3.0, because uh, a lot of definition from scholars, academicians, industry players. Web 3 actually is an upcoming uh, third generation of internet where websites and apps will be smart thinking like human uh, to process data uh, by using AI, machine learning, uh, blockchain, and a lot of uh, emerging tech. And, and this term of a Web 3 coined by Dr. Kevin Wood. Uh, he's a co-founder of Ethereum and then also the founder of uh, Polkadot as well and parity, solid, uh, parity programming language for Ethereum base. So, so uh, by having this Web3 means that, if I can see it like this, Web 1.0 actually is for just, a, just the internet, right? Web 2.0 is a social internet, while Web 2.0 actually is a semantic, semantic web where I think uh, AI will be there, machine learning, and the best thing about Web 3 actually is about how we can control our data. Like we, before this, our data, if you use Facebook, Facebook, Google uh, will benefitize your, your data. So this thing. And second thing about uh, the use cases, there are a lot of use cases. For example, Metaverse now. In fact, Facebook also changed to the Meta, uh, I mean the name. And then uh, next-gen uh, gaming, uh, next-gen dApps, uh, virtual uh, co-working space place virtual reality for land, for example, I'm part of the industry advisory panel for several universities to talk about how we can create our own solution on, on real estate, for example. So this thing actually, the value came because of these use cases. So what value actually uh, from these use cases? It's about transaction. For me, Metaverse is about transaction. Your kids, my kids actually play Roblox. I can see also Robux is a part of the Web3 application, right? They, 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 they buy Robux, you know, uh, or always power my money, you know, to buy the Robux, for example, right? So, uh, recent land, uh, sandbox, you can have your own virtual land, you can transact it, you can transact. Uh, now, a lot of a movement that if you use Metaverse, you do some presentation, you can have visibility in terms of your brand. Justin Bieber, for example, now having their own uh, he has uh, he had their, his own branding in Metaverse on Metaverse concept. Like me, I'm working with Siti Noliza to, to develop the first uh, virtual and Metaverse concept for her. So I think it's a thing that uh, we, can, we can apply in terms of use cases and also interesting. Uh, value for the Web3. Thank interesting, you. Interesting, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants a ticket to sit your go. online free, virtual concept? <laughs> Does anybody else have uh, any other thoughts on that? I just, just a quick add on yeah, to, yeah. To, to what you said, right? I think, I think one of the key, key words here is ownership, right? And I think one of the most exciting things that you can do when you own things, it's very different in a, in a Web3 world where you actually own it versus a Web2 world where you don't really own it. They say you kind of own it, but in the end, it's actually controlled and it's actually owned by a centralized um, um, institution or force, right? One example, it's, it could be social identities, right? And you hear all these things called NFTs, right? You see a picture of, a, of an ape, and you'd be like, why do people pay $100,000, right, for a picture like that? Okay, at a point, people are paying $400,000 for just a picture like that, right? I mean, the power behind that is because it's not just a picture. It's something that you can own, you can verify that you actually own it. And that's the only piece of picture, verifiable, that I actually own it. And because of that, suddenly it unlocks so many things. Two things that probably will excite people like you guys, right? It's one, it's social status, right? Because when I own something and I can prove the ownership of something, suddenly that value becomes so much more powerful. And the beauty about NFTs that we see today is like, you know today, I don't know how many of you guys wear Rolexes or your Patek Philippe, right? The idea is that, okay, cool, right? It brings up my social status. I actually own it, that's amazing. But the beauty around the world that we live in now, it's such a digital world. I can't really show my Rolex constantly on my Twitter. Can I post a bit of photo, try to flex my arm? Right? But the beauty about NFT PFPs, for example, right? it's a photo that you know for sure is yours, and that becomes your identity, right? and that unlocks the entire whole social paradigm and societies and status. That's one. On the other hand of things is then, because you actually own these assets, you can actually do so much with it. One example is that you could financialize almost everything. An example. 
let's say I buy a ticket to, I don't know, you mentioned City No Haliza's concert, right? Yeah, Metaverse concert, right? And the, and the ticket maybe costs, I don't know, 500, 500 ringgit, 1,000 ringgit, okay? To a layman, that's a lot of money, right? But because I own this, let's say the ticket is an NFT ticket, right? And because this is a, it's so easy to prove that I own this ticket, I can easily pawn it, quote unquote, and I can maybe unlock 60% of its worth, 600 ringgit in cash, right? And I can use this cash to feed my dog, you know, water my plants, right? So you can do so much things. What this one example, right, of how financialization can affect normal goods that we typically just use on a daily basis because these are truly owned by the user. Yeah, that's my extra two cents on that. Got time now? Got time? Go, 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 You can divert, we can let this be a casual conversation. Yeah. Super, okay, all right. Yep. Uh, so I think uh, the, the, the first thing I want to say is I think when when you mention Web3 to regular folks, right, it, it scares them away. No, it's like Web3, what, what, what is Web3? Uh, I, I, would like, I would like to define it more as an extension of Web2 to, to address shortcomings of Web2. Uh, having said that, I think uh, the way I look at it, you break it down to two very large segments. So the first one is, it is an, an enabler or means of transferring value. Uh, the second one being, it's basically a distributed database where you can build stuff on top. So looking at it from this angle, right? Uh, we can see being applied to the uh, existing uh, verticals, uh, the existing industry. Uh, you have uh, gaming, right, for instance. So uh, what we've seen, like the very early use cases of gaming is uh, the uh, points within games are being tokenized. So that adds more liquidity, adds more value to the gamers. Uh, then you have verticals like uh, metaverse, right? So metaverse, we've seen it already happening with people buying uh, virtual lands that are basically NFTs, right? Uh, and then you have it with uh, uh, tra traditional finance. So obviously in finance, uh, it's already being done. You have this thing called DeFi, decentralized finance, where you can take loans and just a variety of things that are being done then. And last but not least, I think as a general purpose platform, you're able to build what we call uh, decentralized applications, uh, well, like what has been, has been mentioned earlier. So I think looking at this stuff, that's kind of, kind of how, how I look at it. Uh, you know, it's, it's demystifying it. Uh, it's an ex extension of uh, Web 2 uh, to address shortcomings by providing these two things that I mentioned about. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so I, I totally agree with a lot of what the panelists said. Um, <clears throat> the way I kind of think about it is, right, like, whether you call it Web Web 3, Web 4, Web 5, I mean, I guess only Jake Dorsey wants to call it Web 5, right? Um, it's, as, as some of the panelists have shared, right, it's to address the shortcomings of what we today experience as the internet. So if you go back in time and see how the internet was designed, it originally was, I, I think, a series called an ARPANET, right? So it, it, it dictated how computers speak to each other, essentially nodes talking to each other. In this generation of what we have is the internet, by design, it lacks two fundamental layers, right? Number one is an identity layer. That's why whoever you are on the internet, your kind of internet identity is your IP, but then there's nothing more than that. You can elect to have a Gmail address, but that's not the same as saying that that's really you. Um, and the second is a financial layer, right? The, the internet was specifically designed not to handle financial transactions natively. And so what I believe we're seeing in the last, you know, you could say seven years, are iterations of people trying to solve these two key problems that didn't exist in the original internet, but could unlock a new, a new generation of commerce through this revised or what, what we call Web3 experience. So I think the jury is still out in terms of what will really constitute Web3 long term, but for sure a lot of what people have been experimenting with, whether it's PFPs around identity, whether it's kind of like your DeFi and financializing different tokenization of assets and all that. I, I, I think these are obvious things to address because we cannot really do it natively on the existing internet. All right, so to summarize, Web3 is kind of building on Web2. It's an enhancement. It's disrupting the existing uh, you know, Web2 uh, spaces. In creating new new kind of apps, right? New kind of uh, uh, utilities, right? Cool. Um, so I'm going to condense my questions. I think because because of time. So let's you know we talked about building global applications and do we have you know do we have the right talent? Do we have the right infrastructure in place, right? To to develop this, you know, are we ready to take on a global challenge in this space? Actually? 
Okay, I think it's a very good question from Mohan. So we talk about talent. Talent is a very quite, I mean, it's, it's quite challenging for us uh, to develop such as this talent. Because why? Because we can say that most of the universities uh, still outdated in terms of their modules on the IT. Blockchain is quite rare for the lecturers, even to the, for, for the lecturers. So what uh, actually uh, we are lacking actually is in terms of uh, education modules. So what we are doing right now from Crypto Valley Malaysia perspective, um, we, we develop a lot of module for trainings, for example. We have our uh, professional diploma in blockchain technology. So we are the first in, in, in Asia and in Malaysia creating this module approved by SNAP of University, uh, UMP, University Malaysia Pahang and MSU. Uh, Malaysia, uh, Management and Science University, where uh, now we have uh, 120 students, seven batches, but still not enough. The demand, the demands are are there in terms of our development. So uh, it's quite challenging. So we need to create talents. We need to be to be mainstream, create more awareness like this. And thank you to uh, MDAC and thank you for MDAC for this kind of session with a legendary uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Ganesh, the founder of uh, MOL, Nafne. We have Dato. Fazli, the CEO of uh, you know uh, Max Global, Etherscan, you know very famous overseas. In fact, so so this kind of awareness movement need to be established, unite together, and with MDAC maybe we need to create more talents. I believe that we need to approach more universities and create the local talents uh, because uh, if not, we will have a brain what you call it? brain brain drain. Yeah, uh, okay. this kind of. A, yeah, I, I think the three things that we have to think about when it comes to talent and what you need to create talent. The first, I think, which is actually the most important is exposure. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of us who are early in the internet never got trained how to use the internet. When I first started to use the internet in the year 1995, nobody taught us how to use, how to connect a modem to a computer and dial in at that time to bulletin board service in Singapore. Jaring hadn't formed yet or just about to yeah. be formed, right? Nobody trained us how to do it. Remember the modem sounds, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? So, but, you know, we, we learned about it, we read about it, and so we had to create our own exposure at that, that time. Now, today is very different. Everybody knows about crypto, everybody has heard about crypto, we all are, have the same exposure. Anybody born in the valley in San Francisco today, or born here in Malaysia, has the same exposure to, te to new technology. So the world is now flat when it comes to exposure. So mm -hmm. in that, we, we, have, we have benefited, I would say. So exposure is the same. The second, of course, is formal training. Now, we may not have the formal training to train blockchain developers. Yes, so I'm sure it's good to know that now we have um, that there are initiatives such as Crypto Valley Malaysia that's doing formal training. And I think that has to be promoted and encouraged. I think we do have a very uh, proactive government in this country as well when it comes to technology. And of course, I think there needs to be pu more public-private partnerships with MDAC and Crypto Valley Malaysia. Of course, I know Dato Fast has also partnered with MIMOS. So we need to have more public-private partnerships to promote that formal training that needs to be done. And the third, of course, is experience. So once you've got the exposure, once you've got the training, now what's key also is which is most key actually is experience. So that's why I think it's great that a lot of tech startups now, we've started to invest in tech startups as well in the space. And these tech startups can either hire these programmers or for example, even we invest in some of these graduates, for example, and that will help create our first generation of startups. Just like if you look back at 1995, the same time MOL and Jobstreet and all were created, it's those guys that then created the, the people that later form uh, FAVE and whatnot, right? So I think we, we are in the right direction. I think what's needed right now is that public-private partnership to promote more training, more formal training maybe, okay. to promote crypto and blockchain. So again, I think it's passed on to MDEC now. To, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think experience is uh, it's hard for to do. Yeah. That, that's, you know, maybe I could probably talk to the most experienced person here in the panel, uh, Ethos Ken, Mr. Matthew. Awesome. Yeah, so you're one of the OGs in the yeah, space. I feel, feel really old. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, I agree with what being said, one extent on that. Uh, so I think, at least on, on our end, right, I think the biggest impact that we can do is to inspire, is to prove to people you can build global companies out of Malaysia. 
Uh, and if you inspire that new generation, uh, the younger folks coming to ecosystem will 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 have something to benchmark against. Uh, it's the same like what MOL and Joffrey did back in the days, right? So that that is inspiring. So it's also inspiring people to to build on Web3. Uh, and from the industry portion, I think uh, if you look at Web3, right? So Web3 is not geographical. It's not limited by geography, right? So you build Web3, it's basically global, right? So Keeping that in mind, with most of the best piece stuff, it is not geographical, so meaning you compete on a global scale. So uh, when you look at that, right, uh, I think the other thing that you will probably run into is when it comes to uh, a talent crunch. Uh, so I say talent crunch, not to say that we don't have the talent, but how do we retain the talent that we already have? So I think the, it makes sense to have uh, a little bit more emphasis on that. How do you retain talent? How do you retain uh, companies operating within uh, 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 Malaysia to to and uh, and stuff like that, looking towards the angle. Yeah. If I can add, right? So so I mean I'm operating a company that that uses Malaysian talents, right? And uh, two 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 observations. First observation is you actually got to start them young. So like I think in Malaysia today, across every single university out there, correct me if I'm wrong, right? But there's only APU has a recognized blockchain society. Correct me if I'm wrong, okay? And I even have a friend uh, who's trying to start some stuff in like Sunway or Monash, for example, right? They don't get the support internally, even just from a, just even an interest group for blockchain, right? So I'm not sure where the support has to come from, from the government. Second observation around talent, right? So once these guys graduate, start working, or they get, they become, become a blockchain um, capable um, dev, right? The problem that we're facing today is you know, this whole work from home environment, it's actually very bad because Malaysia tech people are very cheap. That's the, that's the industry's best kept secret. And right, people like us, we are facing competition. My top guys are being poached by Silicon Valley people. Yeah. And I have to just sell them a dream that you know, it's not about the money, you know, it's about, <laughs> it's about the vision. Yeah. You know? And then maybe then you can keep them, right? But dude, I mean, if I go and give you an actual pay, like these guys are offering four times more than what I can pay them from an industry standard. So I'm not sure, again, how we're going to tackle that, that disparity in pay, especially working fr remotely is now a massive uh, thing in the workforce. Difficult to maintain our staff, actually. They will go to another companies uh, after they get the knowledge on the design of emerging tech and blockchain. Yeah. Yeah, I think this issue is a standard issue across the entire tech industry, not just uh, Web3, but the entire tech industry, especially during the pandemic, face this so it's actually a blessing that companies like custom and um, and uh, shopee are retrenching people because at least we can try to hire some of them <laughs> fast you got anything there no i mean I, I i i got comments on like gen z and uh, work from home or work from office but i think that's for a different panel uh, yeah, yeah right yeah um i think a few few points i think number one i think the government is good at amplifying successes so if you, there's already a success, then you can amplify that. We should uh, sell Matt. <laughs> so, no, yeah, no. Oh. like I said, I didn't, I didn't know no, he was heading into scan. <laughs> Mohan has known Matt for, for the better part of two decades and only recently realized he's, he's built a, a Web3 unicorn. So, you know, if it wasn't obvious to Matt's own uh, what neighborhood friend, I yeah. think we have to do a good job of uh, yeah, telling yeah. the rest of the world <laughs> the scan's based here. Best kept secrets, huh? Yeah. So... I guess, you know, talent, talent retention, I, I hear you on the global side. I think uh, it's the same thing with uh, even the games industry. Uh, we have a big growing games industry here. We are very competitively priced. So two things I think just drawing from that industry. Well, one is the projects that you're working on. You need to inspire. Your project needs to be inspiring, I think. Right? The people that they work with. Uh, so these are some of the things that they used, of course, the culture. And, as you. Obviously, you know, working for a PlayStation versus working for a local company, right, is, is very different, right, the, the sexiness of it. All right, and, uh, you know, I, I recently we, there's an announcement of, you know, Mimos and, uh, <laughs> and uh, together with, with MyEG on, uh, on infrastructure, right, blockchain infrastructure. Uh, so, you know, how, how will this infrastructure support you know the nation moving forward. How is it going to help out? Uh, what does it mean for the rest of the, the of the, the population, right? Um, 
and the businesses in the country. So I'm probably going to start with Fast, uh, since Dr. Fast, since he's... Uh, sure. Um, okay, I'm just trying to think really, really fast, like how, how do you answer this without tripping over anything. So, we, we totally acknowledge the fact that like a lot of what is now Web3 or, you know, kind of stemmed out of blockchain, crypto movement, very much grassroots, totally decentralized movement, right? Um, but we also acknowledge the fact that governments and businesses at large have the hardest time trying to incorporate those or participate within these systems. I think, as you can see, with many crypto kind of or blockchain projects, it's very retail first. And at some point, maybe some institutions can involve. But so that's where we, we identify that the next wave, maybe not even the immediate next wave, but surely a wave after that, is that where you connect, essentially blockchains are, are databases, right? Distributed databases. How do you connect data so that it can flow, not just freely, but securely and in a way that can be usable for business between different borders. Because that's where the segregation is now, right? You can see what's happening with the SEC in the US, they're trying to clamp down. Even, uh, you know, you, you brought up PFPs, right? The SEC a couple of days ago said, hey, now we're gonna look at like Yuga Labs, Bored Apes, maybe that's not just a picture, if there's more than that. So we definitely think regulators and motivated governments will catch up faster than the ones, obviously, who are more passive. So one way of getting ahead of the opportunity is trying to make sure that the pipes to be able to move data securely and in ways that governments appreciate um, and, and will recognize and honor uh, has to be done. So China is the first country in the world to have done this, where they have a national level infrastructure for blockchain, right? And we're not talking about cryptos or, or like uh, to uh, speculative tokens and all that. We're talking about just movement of data, right? Across different value chains. So uh, what, what Maiji did uh, that eventually became Zetrix was negotiate exclusivity to be able to pass data in and out of China. And, and in that regard, Maiji was very, very fortunate. They were not the only suitors, but they were very fortunate because the Chinese government made an active policy decision that Chinese data on their blockchain will always ever remain onshore, at least for the foreseeable future. So now this opens up the other part of the puzzle where how do you then handle data that leaves China and goes into China? So essentially what we're hoping to be able to, uh, to realize with Mimos is not, is essentially not trying to build apps or dApps for the government. It's trying to make sure that, you know, whatever it is, whether it's uh, supply chain financing, supply chain management, where national data or, or national based data moves out of the country and into another country, that can be done securely. So that may apply to some blockchain projects, may, maybe not all, probably not all, right? But for some who are looking at more industrial use cases, traceability, I think if any brought up just now, like they're doing uh, traceability. So these are part of the pipes that you may need. Yes. Uh, we don't have an active vision to build all of the dApps. We want to make sure that the, the pipes are there, the infrastructure is there. But in doing so, you have to probably trial with a few applications in the, in the first generation. Yeah. I think, uh, I think uh, uh, maybe to it, just one, two minutes. Uh, agree with the talk fast. Before you want to enter into the blockchain, for example, right? Most of the enterprises, they don't understand. In fact, also from the government is as well. If your data is still, I can say that uh, Web 1.0, right? Most, most of the data also manually. So when you want to, to, to jump to, to the blockchain, it's quite difficult. So why, why we need that some sort of a, like blockchain certification, for example, for the starting point. And second thing, from our perspective, we need support from the government to ensure that uh, they understand blockchain very well. They adopt it uh, from the government, then into the, into the, into the uh, private sector. For example, chronology of the blockchain scene, history in Malaysia, actually started by MDEC. MDEC invited uh, Vitalik Butrin, a small scale event, 2017. I was there, uh, I met with, uh, Vitali, I asked him what we need to do to promote your atrium. He said that, go to university. But he, uh, uh, they were dropped off from university actually, uh, Vitali, at that time. Then I start to do some development. So something on the tax also, uh, country like Estonia and country like uh, Dubai already have a metaverse policy. So we need, we need to have a clear, Thailand also already have a metaverse policy, very clear in terms of adoption into the government. So community need to support by, uh, by that. Crypto Valley, Switzerland. Actually, it's the first Crypto Valley in the world. They established in 2016. They have 10 unicorns from Crypto Valley, Switzerland. They have 20 billion worth industry from their Crypto Valley. And our Crypto Valley is the second in the world. 2018, we established, but we are not focusing on the crypto. We're focusing on the cryptographic tech, security, data forensic, and hopefully, please pray for us in Crypto Valley administration to spur the knowledge, to spur the awareness into the industry and also private public sector. 
I, I think I, I totally agree. I think what's also very important is the is the applications. So we talked earlier, I think, about NFTs and we talked about NFTs being a way to show I call it ego trip sometimes. I have a Rolex watch, I've got this NFT, right? But then I think when you look at businesses and brands and you know we deal with KFC, Unilever, PNG, they're among our clients and they'll ask Fine, that's well and fine. That's a lot of hype. And since now the hype is gone, we don't even want to touch it. Because they don't really see the application. They don't really see the use case. And I think that's what's most important today. If you look at NFT, there are many applications. Bought it your club, you can say, yeah, fine, buy an NFT for 100000 But why do people buy an NFT for $100,000? It's really because of the other people that have bought that NFT. It's people like Mark Cuban. We have bought the NFT. You want to communicate with Mark Cuban, you buy that body of your cup, you go into the metaverse, the outer side, and you get, you get to talk to them, right? So people buy it for community management to meet other people. So that's one application. The second application really is, for example, loyalty and merchandising. Brands always want to create loyalty among their consumers. And of course, Web3 enables brands to engage in a very open manner, in a very... Um, open manner with their community and to create loyalty with their community. And the third, of course, is brand activation. There's so many different brand activations that you can do with the metaverse. And today is really the early days. I always say that this central land and, uh, and uh, sandbox is the friendster of social networking. Facebook isn't there yet. But I'm actually curious, uh, following up with the you know, infrastructure question, right? Do we have the tech infrastructure. What what are the tech infrastructures needed, right, to you know, to develop this, right? So we've got a layer one right now, right? I know, you know, Matthew's been working on the scanners and uh, but do we have sufficient for developers to build on? Yeah. What are your thoughts, Matthew? So uh, infrastructure for tech. Yeah. Or web three. Yeah, web three. It's actually not much different. Well again depending on where you're coming in from, right? So uh, you can go really, really deep the core level, or you don't go really, very deep. You go onto the app level. So on, on the on the app level, actually look at, at what it is. It's not a lot different from Web two. Uh, you're still building, uh, interfacing with uh, what we call API REST calls and stuff like that. So it's actually quite similar. Um, I would say in, in terms of infrastructure uh, and what about like the cloud? I mean, there's decentralized cloud and there's Centralized cloud, right? Actually, so the clouds are all centralized. Mm -hmm. uh, the clouds are running on Azure, Google Cloud, right? So it is yep. actually centralized, right? So it's it's a package cloud. Uh, that's a yeah. It's well, I would say okay. It, it, again, going back to that centralization, it's it's not it's not it's not binary, right? It's not zero or one, right? So there's a level of centralization. So it's obviously uh, lesser centralized, uh, but it is to a certain extent uh, centralized. But, but you know, the fact that in a decentralized system, some parts are centralized services doesn't automatically negate the entire system from, like, like Matthew said, having a high degree yeah. of decentralization. It depends how you measure it, right? Like MX Global, we're definitely a centralized exchange. But there are pros and cons to this approach. It doesn't mean that a Bitcoin in MX is no longer a decentralized Bitcoin compared to when it's on the open network. So, so I, I think it's not a, not a black and white kind of area. Honestly, so infra for the government Please. perspective, it, government need to to develop some sort, some sort like five G, six G. If not, we be a lot of a glitch, uh, bugs, you know. And second things, when you talk about infra from the blockchain perspective, web three perspective, you need to have more validators. You need to have more miners, not not the mining machine for Bitcoin. Something like we need to have more as to scan can be established for example. Tool, basically, for the, the tooling, model, the yeah. tooling layer is the tooling layer so ready. I, I would say not not only tooling. Maybe maybe from from uh, it's probably maybe more guidelines if we're talking from the the government perspective. Uh, so like the ones recently being done, uh, I think IRB came out with their guideline on crypto. So if you know a lot of crypto yeah. folks in, in Malaysia, right, their main concern, right, is taxation. Taxation, right. Yeah. So that guideline was extremely helpful. So that really helps. Uh, I think obviously SE has the list of regulatory changes. So we have folks here, right. So. That really helps. So I think moving towards that direction, providing more clarity, uh, large impact. Okay. I'm going to ask one last question, I think, before a bunch of questions that we have from the audience itself. Um, this, this is too short. <laughs> the time is too short. Um, how, 
how would we position Malaysia? Right? The question is strategically or narratively, right? How would we angle and position Malaysia as uh, a leader, right, in Web3 or the blockchain? Yeah. Maybe start with Faz, Dr. Faz. Oh, I thought I was going to have the easiest time at the end. Um, yeah, I, to, to be honest, like, I, I'm not fully decided, like, well, what I think the best recommendation would be, but, but two ways I would think about it, right? Like, what have we been good at uh, in the past, in the general tech space? And the other is, like, what are Malaysians really doing in Web3 now? So, number one, definitely we've been fairly good at BPO and, and all sorts of degrees of, of outsource, right? Like even in the content space, some of the best, uh, biggest studios in the world uh, work with, uh, you know, gaming and animation studios in Malaysia. So, maybe that's where we fit, right? And I think there's no shame in that. If you do a very good job, kind of as an ancillary or support service, then, um, okay, I mean, maybe most of you don't know, but um, Binance big, Binance's biggest uh, tech support center is Malaysia. They're not Binance staff, but they, are, they use PPO services, which are based in Malaysia. So that's where I think, naturally, what we already have as, as a tech ecosystem can lend itself into the Web3 space. The, the second is that, um, you know, we have a lot of kings of gamblers and cowboys in the, in the Web3 space, right? So, um, you know, not, 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 not everybody is a humble by the book, kind of like build, build a very obvious, mm -hmm. not, not to say obvious, but probably be visible thing in the scan. Matthew Moore, right? Huge, like, like Matthew, so, but there are other guys who are secret whales, right? Yeah, yeah. Plenty so there. definitely, from a funding perspective, a crypto native funding perspective, Malaysians are very, very active. So that may also determine what kind of businesses we can inherently support in our ecosystem. Yeah. Yeah, we had one of the highest hash rates for Bitcoin at some point, remember? Yeah. <laughs> for yeah. a country that has pretty expensive electricity. <laughs> and we also are the top top five actually, top three actually, the biggest uh, mining machines uh, in the world. People don't know about that, but they, they, they make it uh, illegally. <laughs> I, I think if we look at the history of the internet and innovation in the internet, the year 2000, all the innovation started in the valley, if you remember, right? With the yahoos of the world starting there. The year 2010, the innovation actually moved, the hub of innovation moved to China. When WeChat came about, it wasn't WeChat, it was actually QQ came about. Tencent started QQ and that was kind of the hub of innovation for Web2 was actually China. When I mean, it comes to Web3, because China has, in a certain extent, clamped down on blockchain, we have an opportunity here in Southeast Asia to be that hub of innovation. So from Web1 in the Valley, Web2 in China and Web3, I believe, can Southeast be Asia. Southeast Asia. I think everything all the panelists said of why we are we can be the hub of we are already the hub of Southeast Asia and therefore Malaysia can be the hub of Web3 innovation in the world as the innovation happens in this part of the world or this region. First we need to believe to our country, please show to the world that we are good, we are the best. For example, always when I give a speech overseas, people always ask me what is different for us to invest in Singapore or in Malaysia. So we can say like this, Singapore is good on the fintech, for example, right? but we are also good on the supply chain, on the manufacturing, uh, we also have a very good talent as well, people can speak English, uh, infra is better than Thailand, better than Indonesia, and we are same like Singapore. So hmm. what Singapore can do, we can do better, actually. I so I think we can show that kind of a uniqueness, that we have a, a complete ecosystem, we, have a, we can be a hub of innovation, we have the best uh, crypto exchange, MS Global, will be the best soon. We have Etherscan, you know, everything in the world, they refer to Etherscan if you want to do some sort of blockchain verification for the Ethereum. Yeah, you can take my job at MDEC. Yeah, I really think MDEC should consider appointing a as an These people, they are legendary. Uh, founder MLL, founder Mnafnang, here. Yeah. So promote, promote the best of our country. Don't talk shit or talk bad about our country okay. uh, in the social media. Talk uh, the best thing. And the latest information that Malaysia is the friendliest country in the world in terms of uh, with our expert, right? So promoting the best thing. Don't talk uh, bad about our country, that's it. Okay. <laughs> right. Malaysia boleh. Malaysia boleh. Malaysia boleh. <laughs> Anything, I mean, I mean, I share the same view yeah. as uh, Dr. Fazli. I think it, two parts, right? One is you look at what we, what we have, what's a natural right to win, right? And I think IP content is something that we have been helping the world to develop, right? Some of the top games out there, you know that, I mean, some of you guys are gamers. Um, Elden Ring, right? A lot of their assets were developed by Malaysian studios, right? I think the idea is then how, how can we, I mean, we have this rich content of IP and we know that 
blockchain, one of the key value adds ownership. Ownerships and IP, it's a very massive synergy there, right? So maybe that could be one of the key strategic plays, right? Around how can we drive, you know, pure ownerships of IPs. And we've got a lot of new Web3 IPs coming yeah. from Malaysia, Asians, if you guys heard of Nicole from Asian, GCC, all coming from Malaysia, all have raised yeah. a lot of money through selling NFTs. Yeah. And, and that's yeah. and we are the first in the world to uh, define digital asset as a policy, actually, uh, compared to other countries. Uh, policy under SC, digital asset, we are the first. We define uh, Bitcoin, this kind of cryptos as a digital asset. So we need to proud of, on that, on the policy making. And of course, MBAC support very well. MBAC invited uh, Vitalik to come to Malaysia 2017, earliest, part of the earliest in the South East Asian. Right. Okay. So I'm going to ask some questions. Thanks, guys. Uh, I'm going to ask some questions from the audience. Um, first one is, uh, you know, uh, great panel lineup. What would be your advice to parents to get more young talent into the Web3 space? Uh, is there immediate career opportunities now? Play Roblox. <laughs> play Minecraft. No, really. My kids, uh, um, I mean, they, they play those. Yeah. Then you have active experience of like how you start creating assets in game and everything. This is not really, I, in my view, it's not something where you go to school and learn chapter by chapter uh, of how to do it, right? I think they need the hands-on. And, and typically, if you have young children, these are the kind of games that probably immerse them closest to the builder type experience into a metaverse. So I think the NFTs had a big impact on kids. Yeah, yeah. Find, like people can see a picture fan. of an ape, they can't no, see I mean, it. Uh, kids going online and uh, putting like, pixels together and able to sell it online, you know, that was had a, like a super big impact. I really my own kids, right? Yeah, true, true. But, but I think that, that said, we do need to kind of not not create a mindset among our public that crypto and NFTs is all about speculation. It's yeah. not. It just so happened that when new technology comes up, people get all excited and then when there's excitement, people see speculation just like in the year 2000. But crypto, blockchain, NFTs is not about making money. It's about creating value and that's what we need to make sure our public actually knows. Right, I'm just going to ask one more question. Yep. Uh, so, everyone says the metaverse is the future, uh, but no one medium has taken off. Uh, why is this? Maybe let the okay. part, let it. Just a minute. To create metaverse is very tough, actually. They, you need to have a seven layers on infra, discovery, uh, in terms of uh, uh, token economics. So, every layer has different uh, programming languages, expertise. So, so that's the thing. But, but the future of a metaverse will be now the value of metaverse is around 10, 20 billion USD, going to be 100 billion uh, forecasting by 2025. This reported by Forbes. So, we need to be involved at least starting started from by with uh, NFT first, then go for VR, and, and need to have a collaboration approach by industries and also government. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I would say you can go back and see why Facebook actually came in the year 2010. What was the biggest differentiation between 2008 or 2005 when Friendster started? And when Facebook really started, Facebook actually became the most popular social network in Asia in 2010. And the reason why it became the most popular network in social media, because I know, because I bought Friendster about that time, is Facebook had a in, I, iPhone app, smartphone app, and Friendster didn't. And that's why Facebook really killed the hell out of Friendster uh, in 20, 2010. That was before I acquired the business, right? So actually what is really needed to grow the metaverse is actually devices. Mm. The devices we have today, the Oculus for example, is just not ideal enough yet. Until the glasses came out, I'm told Apple is announcing something in January. Until devices that don't make you giddy, don't make you vomit after using it for one hour come out, metaverse will not proliferate. Actually, it's a good point. I think a lot of it's a latency issue, right? Yeah. That, that that makes people giddy. But I think I think one more thing. I think that that why metaverses today don't fly yet. I think from a from a gamer, right? Effectively, or from any kind of any kind of environment you want to create, right? You need to have a hook, right? And a lot of times, you want to create worlds. Your worlds need to have content as a hook, right? It could be a game. It could be some form of engagement. It could be some form of key celebrity there, right? But if your world is just a world, it's just a platform. 
without any form of content hook, it's, it's going to be empty work. Right? I think that's the approach that a lot, a lot of people today are building the infra layers, right? Which is, to be honest, not wrong. You need it to happen first, right? But it takes time for content to actually come on, and when the content comes on, that's where you start seeing adoption. So it's, uh, I think it's more about time rather than whether it, whether it will work or not. So you need the iPhones and the Zingas of the world? Uh? Yes. Anybody else? Otherwise, we I, I think it's the. I agree. I think it's the devices. Basically. I have like five or six different Oculuses at home uh, from different the, the generation two and stuff like that. Right? It's just too heavy, too hot. Uh, battery life too short. So I think once that that is being addressed, right, uh, with lighter devices, more portable devices, right, you should see that next wave. So, that, so basically, it's the issue of infra from, from the hardware side. I don't. My personal opinion is I don't think the metaverse is going to happen like how we're talking about it today. Mm. I don't think it's going to be a portal that you access through a device mm. or through a screen and then you kind of live in this second world, right? I mean, we've had it before, Second Life, yeah. um, like lots of different iterations of that. Uh, actually, I kind of agree with Ganesh. I think something like Apple Glasses might be the one that changes the game. Personally, I believe like what we might in the future eventually settle on and call the metaverse is this augmented reality where you're actually in you're actually in this room, but there are things in this room which exist on that plane or on that virtual layer that you interact with, and that might be I mean because that's such, such a much more superior user experience than hanging out in VR chat, right? Yeah, it's like cyberpunk, right? <laughs> all right, uh, I think that's all the time we have. Uh, it's a really great session. Uh, wish we had more time. So I would like to thank once again uh, the esteemed panel panelists that we have here today. Uh, big experience, big uh, dreams, and uh, hopefully you get inspired by them again. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you once again to Mohan and our panelists Matthew, Jansen, Ganesh, Effendi, and Dato Fazli. Now, Mohan, a little bird has come over and whispered to me in my ear that today might just be your birthday. So we would like to take this opportunity to wish you a very happy birthday. Thank you. <laughs> the parties with my kids. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much again, Mohan, for spending your precious birthday day with us. Uh, thank you so much, gentlemen, for your fantastic insights and input. That certainly clears up a lot about Web3 for me in general and hopefully for the members of our audience. Thank you so much, gentlemen. In the meantime, ladies and gentlemen, please do take note of the uh, QR code that we have on Slido. Give us your feedback. I know you thought these were, this was a great panel session, so please do let us know. Give us the feedback via survey on the QR code that is on the screen right now. In the meantime, let me just quickly summarize um, the notes that I've taken for this session. Web3 is the next evolution of the internet. The future, so to speak. It's the current Web 2.0, but with added functionality. But in Malaysia, it's early days yet. Real-world applications for Web3 being developed in Malaysia are fresh and capable of going global, leveraging off data sharing, blockchain, machine learning, AR and VR, mainly in the areas covering NFTs, gamification, and the metaverse. Web3 will give us the capabilities to decentralize community and database ownership, finance via cryptocurrencies and data sharing in general. But Malaysia faces challenges of building sufficient talent. And the key here is experienced players needed through the public-private partnerships to develop and most importantly, retain talent. So what else does Malaysia need to build a path ahead? Suggestions include a national level of infrastructure for blockchain like in China, taxation or metaverse policies like they have in Estonia, and more widespread tech infrastructure and ecosystem for our developers to build on. Are we ready? Maybe not quite yet, but in Web3, Malaysia is already the hub of ASEAN, and it definitely has the opportunity to be the global hub of innovation for Web3 once the devices stop making us feel dizzy, that is. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that's all the time we have for track two today. I hope you found these sessions informative and helpful as we head into day two tomorrow of Malaysia Digital Week. We'll see you in the same room tomorrow for some great discussions at 11 a.m.
However, other panel sessions continue until 5.30 p.m. in breakout room one with Naz Nazruddin Rahman. So please feel free to head there to learn more on issues pertaining to the tech sector. Till then, I'm Shani Iman Lee. Have a great evening and a safe drive home. <laughs>